Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics. In this video, we're going to discuss Coriolis Charge Motion. Coriolis Charge Motion is unique to Ethereal Mechanics. You will not find any other branch of science that even considers this effect. And I'm going to show you experimental corroboration of this very important charge effect. This is the seventh video of New Electromagnetism Version 5. And New Electromagnetism Version 5 is the fourth paper in the Ethereal Mechanics series. So Coriolis charge motion, we're going to define that. And then we're going to derive the Coriolis charge effects from new electromagnetism V5. And then we're going to show you the experimental corroboration. This is the first video in the new electromagnetism V5 paper that has been released since the completion of the paper. So now we can actually link this video to a chapter in the paper. The paper release to Patreon members is here. Public release is going to be July 4th. But if my Patreon members want more time, we will be pushing that out. This is up to them. It's not up to me. Uh, also, for the videos that came before, because some of the terminology has been improved and there are certain corrections that need to be made, like missing sign and missing and change in terminology, some of the previous videos will be reshot for the public releases. Uh, to my Patreon member, there won't be any new material that you're not already aware of. It's just basically improving the language and the format to make it more consistent with the paper. So what is Coriolis charge motion? So I have a little animation here that I made specifically for this video. It shows a little channel containing what could be masses or they could be charges, they could be anything. And because they're moving at velocity through this channel as they move toward the outside of the wheel, their tangential velocity increases. That is acceleration. Now Coriolis charge motion just doesn't work in this direction. If the charges are moving in any direction relative to the spinning wheel, they will produce a Coriolis charge acceleration. So in the legacy textbooks, they use a rotating reference frame. They usually show a wheel, and then they show a particle moving in the wheel. And this omega represents the angular velocity of the wheel in radians per second is represented as a vector, a vector coming from the center of rotation normal to the spinning wheel. And this particle has a velocity relative to the spinning wheel. And they use the term, some people use the omega, some people use lowercase omega. My textbooks always use uppercase omega as the rotation vector. And this velocity is relative to the rotating reference frame. We're also going to say omega is a rotating reference frame. So to derive, to define the Coriolis acceleration of this charge or particle, whatever it is, you take twice the rotation vector times the cross product of the velocity of the particle, and that gives you the accelerate the Coriolis acceleration. Now I've always had problems because why are we representing a rotation with a vector? Okay, and that kind of I mean, it works. I'm not complaining too much about it. It works. It gives the correct answer, but it's just kind of dimensionally inaccurate to do that. But let me show you a methodology that has no spatial infractions and is the cornerstone of ethereal mechanics, and that's Vortrix Algebra. Now, I'm showing the same diagram before, so you can keep the same orientation as I describe the slight difference here. Okay, we define a matrix. This brackets represent a matrix. So this omega is not a vector now, it's a matrix. And you, you can compute this matrix, matrix using Vortrix Algebra by taking a point on the spinning wheel somewhere, some point over here, and then you take the tangential velocity of that point and divide it by the vector from the center to the location of that point to compute the rotational matrix. And again, the Coriolis acceleration then in Vortrix Algebra is two times the rotation matrix times the vector motion of the particle. So going back to the inertial force model from electrogravity, this was derived in electrogravity, papers EM03. 
You can find it at the distinti.com website. I'll show you how to find that toward the end. The inertial force model, which is also called new induction, has been with the new electromagnetism series since the very beginning. It started this whole thing that eventually turned into ethereal mechanics. It's basically F equals MA. Now, in the construct the constructs paper, the second paper of the ethereal mechanics series, we argue there should be no arbitrary constants of relation. That is turned into the rule of acquisition 24. There will be a new video out on the rule of acquisition 24 in the next couple of weeks to show you that if your units of measure are completely arbitrary, there should be no arbitrary constants of relation. Okay, and so there are no, there's no mu here anymore. This is the natural unit of force now, which is square amperes, and this is what we're using predominantly. The only time we will convert to legacy units is when we have to make a measurement with a legacy instrument that's still calibrated in volts. Okay, that's the only reason so we keep this around. So this Km is mu over 4 pi. And that's used everywhere to convert from legacy, uh, from natural to legacy units. And we represent legacy units in blue to distinguish them from natural units when things are represented on the same piece of paper to avoid confusion into what's what. So what we're going to do is take the Coriolis charge acceleration that we just derived and insert that into the inertial force model to produce the Coriolis inertial effects. And there are both forces and there are VIMs. VIM is a new terminology for EMF. So let's compute the Coriolis inertial force. And this will be the point-to-point -point model in Vortrix representation. So we get our Coriolis acceleration here, and we take our Coriolis acceleration and put it into the acceleration part of our inertial force model. I bubbled the two because it's a scalar. I bubbled it over to the beginning. Okay, and then we take our charge of that particle and put it in for the source. Boom, that's all you have to do. And now you have the Coriolis inertial force, point-to-point -point vortex. What this means here is if you have another charge somewhere else, it could even be on the wheel, it doesn't matter, and you have this charged particle moving with velocity s omega, this means it's moving relative to the frame omega, it's the velocity of the source, the charge of the source, then this will be the effect due to the Coriolis motion of this charge on a some target charge somewhere else. R is the vector distance from the source to the target. And this means F on the target, force on the target. Again, because it's in black ink, it's in natural units. But we also want to know how we can develop the interaction. So you have magnets or coils containing current on this wheel that are spinning with the wheel. Well, they're going to experience Coriolis charge effects as well. So what we want to do is because magnets and coils can all, can be modeled as current carrying conductors, then we want to turn it into a fragmentary. This is a fragment of a conductor. We see the stationary charges, or I'm sorry, the unbalanced charges and the conduction charges we typically represent with light blue. And so for core, for acceleration, though, we only really care about the conduction charges. And we put down our point to fragment conversion identity here. This is in the paper. This is also discussed in the previous papers, previous videos. So that if you have a, a quantity of charge moving at velocity, that's the same thing as a current times a differential length. These are unitarily identical. So what we want to do is we want to compute the force, I'm sorry, the velocity. So we're going to derive the velocity here. So we can put the velocity into our Coriolis expression here. Once that is done, we're going to multiply both sides by dq so that we get a quantity of charge times acceleration. The quantity of charge times acceleration is what we put into the inertial force model. And so we put this into the inertial force model. And that's all you have to do to get the Coriolis inertial force fragment to point in Vortrix representation. Okay, next thing we want to do is, well, what if we have, we want that magnet or coil that's rotating on the reference frame to couple to another coil or uh, that, so you can measure the EMF from the rotation of that coil or magnet. Well, all you have to do is take your fragment to point form right here, divide both sides by QT, and then dot product both sides by the differential length of the target filament. 
and then that produces your your, your VM. Now, because there's two uh, diminishing operators here, we need two diminishing operators on the left. So in order to find the complete effect between a source loop or a source magnet and a target loop, you have to do a dual path integral over the conduction paths. And then you have your Coriolis inertial vim, the new term for EMF. Fragment to fragment, or also called interfragmentary, in Vortrix representation. That's all there is to it. The integrations are the hard part. But luckily we have the physics software which will do this for you. So next we're going to talk about applying what we have developed. Now there's going to be another video which is going to go into detail about how you model magnets and loops of wire with all the, the models. But first we have to get through this in centripetal inertial and the venturi inertial which are the next videos. Okay, but when we get to that video you'll find out that when you're modeling magnets you only need to consider the magnetic and the Coriolis inertial. And we'll get into the detail of why that is the fact when we have that more advanced video. Okay, for wire loops, when you're modeling them as sources, you have to consider all the effects. Now, these asterisks here mean that these effects are incredibly tiny, very, very, very tiny. And one of the upcoming experiments, which we'll get into in more detail later, we're going to be pushing 100 amps of current through a 30-gauge wire to bring this effect to the forefront so you can actually see it. Okay, I mean, that shows you the extreme you need to do to get these things to have some meaningful and that's why the asterisk means, for the most part, for simple experiments, you can most of the time just ignore these two. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to show the, the Physics 2 simulation results for the Paradox 2, 3, and 4 series of experiments. Together, they comprise 54 total experiments. And what we have here is we have magnets that are on a rotating reference frame, rotating around this axis here. Coupling to wire loops, there's multiple different wire configurations. Sometimes the wire configurations move with the magnets, sometimes they're stationary. Here we see the for the physics, normally this is turned off, but you can see a little copper loop around the edge of the magnet where the north and south meet. That is the way we model magnets in, in new electromagnetism. It's a very accurate, very precise way of modeling magnets. Again, when we get to the next the video, when we talk about advanced modeling, you'll see, I'll show you more detail about that. So this is 54 total variations of the paradox 2 through 4. Uh, this list only shows the first 25 uh, in, in a tabular form. This is the plotted results. The red line is the experimental results that we should get. And the black dots are the simulation results for that same experiment. Now, some people may be wondering, why do you show so many experiments that have zero results? <laughs> You're going to find out in a moment that that's very important. Some of these experiments, we have the wire and the magnet rotating together. There should be no results. And we need to confirm that because in ethereal mechanics, any rotation relative to the medium produces results. And in many of those cases, as shown with the Paradox 1 experiment, many of those things cancel each other out and you get, should get no results. So it's very important that we confirm no results when we should be getting no results because they're every bit as important as experiments that do show results. So let me show you this same set of simulations done without the Coriolis component. And you can see that a lot of experiments should produce zero results are not producing zero results. And this is very compelling because in these experiments we have equal and opposite effects. What if we can somehow throw these equal and opposite effects out of balance? That would be an amazing experiment which would show depths, things that we could never have known before because they were canceling each other out. And that would be a one of our Wright Brothers moments is to find an experiment where we could throw these effects out of balance to show an effect where classical theory or everybody else would say, oh, no, there's supposed to be nothing there. OK, so uh, I, I mean, already we're showing that there's something here because we without considering the Coriolis emotion effects, they have to be there to cancel the magnetic effects. Okay, so wherever there is charge acceleration, there will be effects. And when we get to the experiment with centripetal, I'll show you that those effects are there and they're measurable. 
So in the next video, the next video is in the NEV5 series. We're going to continue our discussion of dynamic charge motion, which we'll discuss the centripetal charge motion and then the Venturi charge motion. After that, the next video is going to be the advanced models of magnets and wire conductors. And we're going to give an intro into experimental supplements, some which have already been released. The next video, we're going to derive the Hall effect. And then our conclusion video is going to be predominantly a look ahead. What's in the pipeline? What's coming next? And on all that sort of stuff. Now, if you're on the Distinti YouTube site, you need to get over to the Ethereal Mechanics YouTube site because the Distinti website will no longer be hosting any new Ethereal Mechanics video after probably summer of 2024. Uh, the reason why is I need a break from that site because there's a lot of older, older, older videos on there where a lot of things have been improved and changed. Like there's old videos about Q algebra that I'm still getting comments on, but Q algebra was replaced by Vortex algebra. I don't want to eliminate all that because that's kind of like the history of what happened. I just want to get everybody over to the new modern improved stuff over here. This is a clean, clean set of videos of ethereal mechanics. When the paper is released, to the public, it can be found at the distinti.com website, along with the links to all of the videos in the video series so that you can watch them in the correct order instead of having to try to find them on YouTube. Right now, the electrogravity paper is up. I believe you have to go under the Ethereum Mechanics here, and then there should be a separate link under there for electrogravity. Uh, that paper and video series I've already posted. Uh, I want to shout out to Sebastian for taken care of or hosting the Ethereum Mechanics info site. Um, this is something that he and supporters are producing. I'm sorry I don't have a lot of time to devote to this. I'd, I'd love to spend, I wish I had the time. If I had the, if I had a production crew that can do the videos, I'd spend a lot more time researching and listening to what people have to say. But doing it all is really wearing me out. It really is. And, and I thank my Patreon members uh, for their support. Uh, you guys are just the best. Um, especially some of my Patreon members are engineers. Some of them have been with me for 20 years. And it's great because when I make a mistake, they're all over me. And that's awesome. Because I, I, it's not about me being right. It's about finding the truth, finding the answers. So that we can solve the problems of this planet. Get people off this planet. There's got to be a way. I mean, Ethereum Mechanics says that every cubic meter of empty space contains $17 trillion worth of energy. So there's plenty of energy to move population off the planet. You just got to figure out how to tap into that. Okay, and if you really want to help out, you can be one of my diehard Patreon members. You go to patreon.com, Ethereal Mechanics. So if you can help out, I'd appreciate it because if I could do like what the Y Files does and have a production crew to help do the research, help make the videos, help do all the animations. Uh, we could start producing, moving things a lot quicker ahead than I'm able to do as a single person. Um, so anyway, I appreciate my Patreon folks for their support. Uh, they're the best. Thank you. No more voodoo physics.